You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Uh, it, it, the gardens are looking really good. Oh, my goodness. You can plant anything you want. We are in the absolute peak. There is no chance of frost, even at the higher elevations, even for you folks in that, you know, the White Mountains, Flagstaff areas. Generally speaking, Memorial Day is your last frost date. And so I think you can go ahead, plant tomatoes, plant the basil even. Oh, basil so sensitive to any amount of cold, but I think it's good to go. My my gardens are just actively growing. You put them in and three days later, you can absolutely see them growing. It's very exciting. This is your, your, your time. We're even seeing the first edge of the summer blooming plants. And so you've got crepe myrtles showing flowers, the uh, rose of Sharon's or the hibiscus. These are summer blooming shrubs in the mountains of Arizona. They're showing the buds there. They haven't broken yet, but the buds are huge. And then because it is Memorial Day all weekend long, I, I wrote an article about memorial trees. You know, people are finding that there's a lot of folks putting trees in. We've got, I probably have a thousand trees sitting out there over the two acres here at the garden center, uh, from evergreens to shade trees to fruit trees. I thought people are coming in, planting a tree in memory of. Now this weekend's all about the services, you know, our vets and thank you for serving our, our vets. Uh, I, I, I shared a story of our family, my mother shares a story of she remembers her brother coming to say goodbye. He's going off to World War II uh, in his uniform. He, she was a little girl uh, and remembers his face and when he went off and he never came back. He's buried in Europe. In fact, that's on my to, to-do list. I, I eventually want to go visit his gravesite in Europe. And so he gave his life for the country that he that he loved uh that's that's a memory that's that goes deep in our family and my mother is the is the the, the bearer of that who shares that often so i thought okay planting a tree in memory of a person is great we've always planted births and deaths but also i'm finding pets there's a lot of pet if you lose you go in the lane backyard you'll see a collars hanging from the trees. Those trees are dedicated in, in memory of you know, Max the German Shepherd or, or Cassie the Black Lab or uh, Allie the Springer Spaniel. Uh, we just have different dogs and we have their, their collars. And if they were companions, compatriots, they hung out together, we might have one tree for two of our pets and they share that tree together and you walk out in the gardens and you remember them and their collars and their tags are right there. Then we spread their ashes in the backyard. It's, it's deep and we we do it. For, it's kind of funny. We plant for goldfish. We plant for dead rats. We, I mean, pet rats, uh, of anything that's a pet, we make a ceremony out of it. And hopefully someday when I'm gone, my kids will make a We'll have a ceremony of some sort, spreading my ashes in the forest that I loved or, or planting a tree, my favorite tree. I put together a list of memorial trees, trees for every month of the year that grows in the higher altitudes that look good in that month that you want to remember them. Let's say you, you lost a loved one in January. You would plant an Austrian pine. It's a long needle pine that I think is more hardy than a ponderosa pine, but it still has that long needle and it holds the needle right down to the ground. That's a good one to plant when you want to remember in January during a snowstorm when you're baking cookies and you remember Uncle John or your pet whatever, uh, you can you can look out there. In February, it's aspens, just for that beautiful white bark. I mean, yes, they're pretty with foliage on and that's what you'd plant now, but you want to remember them in February. Aspens look great with that bark that structure in february in march it's the thundercloud purple plum that's the first plum the first pink flowering tree 
uh, blooms in March. It kind of announces spring. It's very tough, very long-lived. Animals don't eat it. It's a robust tree. And then it, it just has this purple foliage right now. In April, it's crab apples. Oh, they were so beautiful this year. Spectacular crab apples. You pick the one you want because all crab apples seem to bloom in April. May, it's purple robe locusts. You can count on them to bloom around Mother's Day. These purple uh, wisteria blossoms hanging down. In June, coming up, it's golden locusts. It's very tough, uh, heat-loving, filtered shade, long, long-lived tree. Locust does really well. Only the golden locust or honey locust does not put the bean pods on. It doesn't have the thorns. So it's, I think it's a better variety as a memorial. Uh, Mountain Magnolia for July. The Magnolia is an evergreen variety and there's a uh, deciduous variety, a really hardy, robust one. Uh, Birch for the month of um, August. Birch, I think birch is actually a better tree than aspens as far as uh, robustness, longevity. It doesn't get wind whipped as easy. The deer don't seem to go after it as much. I think it's a better tree. But in August, it is a beautiful, just superior, beautiful tree. September is the ginkgo. A classic, yes, ancient tree. It's been around since prehistoric times. We've got fossil records of this tree. It lives from now till you and I are long gone, still in memory. October, blazing red maples. Uh, maples are famous in the mountains. This is the fastest growing of the red maples, and it starts to show color in October. November, it's aristocrat pear, the flowering pears. It doesn't put fruit on. It's a great tree for memory if you want to plant a memorial tree for November because it's the last tree to turn red in the fall of the year. Usually around Thanksgiving, it's finally starting to turn red, and then it just loses its foliage. And then in the spring, it will have this beautiful white flower that opens up in April generally. In December, it's the Fat Albert Spruce. If you want a rich blue, just rich like silver blue, the per just perfect Christmas tree shape, you plant a Fat Albert Spruce. And it goes on and on. I mean, anyway, we've got those uh, showing off uh, here at the Garden Center. You can plant them now. But uh, this Memorial Weekend, let's remember our past and those that got us here, those that have fought for our freedom, gave their lives for our freedom, and then also much more deeper than that. Also, just the pets that are there, the the, the births, the the deaths of not just the servicemen, but of those that we love that made a difference in our in our lives, that had influence in our lives. Let's remember those this weekend as well. But very much so, and uh, it's a big weekend for my boy. He is uh, in the army. He's an army physician's assistant. Uh, he runs the first armored division. He's, he's the guy that takes care of all the guys that run the tanks around the world. He's makes sure they're healthy and fit and able to run those tanks around the world. He's their, their go-to guy. Anyway, that's uh, we are proud of him and we, we remember him and, and wish him only the best as he currently protects our freedoms around the world. So uh, memorial trees. If you need more on that, I mean, I was a funny story. I'm hanging all the red, white, and blue colors, the flags, uh, banners, pennants, uh, and I'm hanging them around the garden center this week. Someone goes, what's up with all the colors at the 4th of July? What you doing? I'm going, it's Memorial Day weekend. He goes, oh, God, thanks for reminding me. And I work at the VA too. I can't believe it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Good. I'm glad I could help you remember <laughs> to remember <laughs> this weekend. But it looks pretty fun, pretty active. Lots of flags everywhere here at the Garden Center, at least. We hold our red, white, and blue uh, um, w with pride, and we want to help others do the same. We've got Lisa Waters Lane coming up with, um, really, your your questions. And then I think she, she was curating a whole bunch of plants for monarchs. Uh, the monarch butterflies are floating through. They're here. Uh, they're, they're here to stay. They're laying eggs. And so I'm trying to uh, get more plants in the in the landscapes of northern Arizona that will help them thrive and, and flourish. They're actually struggling uh, to keep their populations up. So she's she's putting together a list of monarch specific plants that they'll love. But first, we've got her coming in with your questions. Don't change that dial. We'll be right back with more. Lots lots in store this show on the Mountain Gardener. 
You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our instant Raywood Ash. Raywoods are known for their handsome fall foliage that turns colors of red to royal purple. Just stunning. The leaves have a fine texture which add a softness to harsh rock yard. At $120, these instant trees are magnificent. 12 feet tall with a 6 foot spread, you won't have to wait for this tree to grow up. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love instant trees, they love to shop. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio with your garden questions. So it has been uh, a busy, active, I don't know what's going on or... They're just the phone calls are going crazy. The emails, I can't answer enough Facebook questions. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we're overwhelmed by questions this time of year because we're in the peak season. People have stuff in. They're going, right? did I do it wrong? What's going on? What's that spot? It's like this week, it's what's that spot on a leaf or what's that bug? (laughs) Why is it glossy? So uh, I think it's important to share those on the airwaves. So mainly... We'll get less phone calls, maybe. I don't know. So yeah, people know what's going don't. on or what's happening or <laughs> <laughs> take the pressure off of the crew. Sure. No, I guess not. We like hearing questions. We do. It just cracks me up. People call and go, this may be a dumb question. I'm always like, well, yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> there are no dumb questions. Actually, there are some dumb questions we found out. But generally speaking, not not so bad. No, so most people are really good. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of questions do we have this week? Well, our first question is from Diane. She's out in Prescott Valley. She just had a pergola put up in her yard. Very nice. And she's looking for suggestions for fast-growing vines. Oh, sure. Now, we've had a pergola over our deck mm-hmm. at, at one of our houses, our first house. We had grapes growing up. Oh, and yeah. The grapes would come down through through those mm-hmm. slats, and you, you could actually harvest grapes right there. Uh, it was quite beautiful, Mediterranean looking. Mm-hmm. Wisteria has been in bloom for over a month, month and a half. Mm-hmm. Those big wisteria blossoms. That's a good, of course, the number one of all of them are claiming roses. Mm-hmm. That's another good choice. If you want lots of color on each post, just put a different color on each each of the four posts or six posts or however big your pergola <laughs> is. Uh, and then uh, what are some others? Uh, Akebia, Akebia is a great one. It's an evergreen variety mm-hmm. uh, that's that grows up that when it's in bloom in spring, the entire pergola is going to smell as sweet as sweeter than a rose. Mm-hmm. It's very nice. A Boston ivy, the native is yeah. is Virginia creeper. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not evergreen, but it's hardy as can be. Nothing right. eats it. It's tough. Mm-hmm. It's not trashy. It's not weedy. It's 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 a good tree. Other thoughts? Uh, trumpet vine. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, trumpet vines are great. Honeysuckle is another one. Uh, another one is uh, I saw someone they planted like two different vines together, and they mm-hmm. use clematis as the flower. Yeah. Poking through the clematis has this big flower that's as big as your hand, mm-hmm. but they had planted it in with like honeysuckle or silver lace vine, something that right. was pretty, but not, it was tough, but it didn't have the flower. Like they put them together and the clematis used the other vine as a claim. Yeah. Climb just up climbed up and yeah. bloomed like crazy. It was, you kind of go, wow, is that, are my eyes tricking <laughs> my, my, what, what is that? Yeah, yeah, that's a neat look. I like that. I would say come in and take a look. There's more choices than that Mm -hmm. uh, here at the gardens. All of them are actively growing right now, so you can get a good feel. You can plant them. you got a whole season, so they'll quadruple in size. So if you get a new pergola, how fun would that be? Take a picture. (laughs) Bring it in. We'd love to help you plant that thing. Definitely, definitely. Okay, 
Next question is from Landon out in Chino. He says, I saw a picture of your time lawn on okay. Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Wants to know what type of lawn was used and if you could use, because there's a lot of different types of time. Could you use any type of time? You can use any kind of time at, at all. Uh, usually creeping time is the one that's most famous and stays lowest to the ground, especially if you're going to be playing or have some activity on it. If it's just if it's just a border kind of planting around the edges, which is more like what ours is, mm-hmm. it's just we've got a patio there and we took the actual lawn grass out. The kids left. We didn't want we didn't have to play soccer and wrestle on the lawn anymore. We're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so we but we still like that area as an entertainment just rest area. Mm-hmm. Um, so we put pavers down and then we surrounded that with, with creeping thyme mm-hmm. and then shrubs and border plants and flowers. And it's beautiful. Uh, I think you could use in that situation, any kind of time you want. Generally, you're going to plant about one, one every foot to 18 inches or so. Okay. Just plug it. So we, for us, mm-hmm. we buried a soaker hose line about an inch under the ground. I ran it for a few minutes, wherever there was a wet spot. I plugged a, <laughs> a creeping time plug in that area. And then it has just filled in. And so Mm -hmm. you saw it on Instagram and Facebook that that's our lawn Mm -hmm. at at sunset. There's a a beam of sunlight coming down. It's just, it's just a real pretty picture. It's surprisingly tough. I mean, the dogs are frequently out there messing around on it and we walk over it to get to other spots in the yard. And it, it certainly takes it. It spots a little bit with the dogs, but then it quickly recovers Mm -hmm. and it reseeds like crazy. Mm -hmm. So if if you got a spot like with a lawn, you can't ever get it to fill back in. Not with a creeping, not with time. Time it will actually reseed and creep over and fill in by Mm -hmm. itself with a little bit of care, a little bit of food. We mow it twice a year. That's it. And then we fertilize it a couple times a year and we water it. I think every 10 days right now. Mm -hmm. So we got it watering, but creeping time. That's how you do it. Okay. For more, come in and see us. Come in and see us. So Sandy in Prescott has a spot that she wants to put a rose, but it only gets about three hours of morning sun. Do you think it would be happy there? Sandy, move on. You don't want a rose. It's not going to work well. Yeah. It'll reach. It'll lo- it won't bloom. Won't You'd be pretty. much better off with azaleas, rhododendrons. There's so Daphne. We just got some beautiful Daphne mm-hmm. in. Oh yeah, loves that ki- kind of spot. Mm-hmm. I think Spirea, Akuba. There's so many great shade loving plants. People want to grow, right? But most yards are just too sunny. Mm-hmm. They won't grow it. And so, so I think I, um, uh, not Ivy, um, Ilex, um, Holly. Mm-hmm. I got too many too, too much Latin <laughs> names going through my Ilex and Holly are the same thing. So yeah. that's another good choice. But for color. Look at azaleas. Look at, we had some uh, beautiful uh, mock orange in full bloom right now. Right. Beautiful fragrance. Hydrangeas. We hydrangeas. Gorgeous hydrangeas. Yeah. Gardenias just came mm-hmm. in. That would love that spot. So we've got a whole shade section. It's got shade fabric. Just come into the nursery. Look for all the shade fabric uh, connected this to the greenhouse. That, those are your plants. Right. Not the not the sunny roses out on the asphalt <laughs> in front of the nursery because you can't get too much sun for them. They they love the sun. More sun equals more flowers with mm-hmm. roses. So they need at least six hours of sun or more uh, to to really perform well. Okay. So I, th- I think that's one. Come in. We'll give you a little tour. Get you pointing the right direction so you don't make a blunder. Mm-hmm. Uh, in two years, you're just going. No, I wish I hadn't made that mistake. And you lost two years right. in the garden. Yeah, you got to put plants where they want to be. Yeah, where they're going to be happy. That's Otherwise, a good question. They don't just. They just don't look their best. It's it's good to check before you oh, yeah. you commit. You know, mm-hmm. uh, roses. They're they're about forty bucks for a spectacular in full bloom, gorgeous. I mean, showstopper, mm-hmm. and you don't want to put that kind of energy into that part of the yard, and then it just, you know, in six weeks, it stops blooming and never blooms again. Right. That's discouraging. We, mm-hmm. we don't want that. It's better to ask. Okay. So Jack would like to know, when he waters his lawn, the water just seems to kind of run off and okay. not penetrate. He wants to know what he can do to help get better water retention in the lawn. Is it something manually he needs to do or product he can apply? What would you recommend? So we, we do have products that help uh, water penetrate into a hard, hard spots. What's happened is uh, it's created almost a turtle shell. So the top layer of that lawn is, has dried out 
And now it's hard to p- penetrate to that. So the water runs instead of mm-hmm. seeps in. So you got to compensate for that. So there's some products here at the garden center. Do you remember the name of that, that product Re- revitalize? I think something like that. Um, Oh no, that's a fungicide. Oh, never mind. Anyway, is it come visit us. Or liquid? We, we've got it here at the garden okay. center. Never mind. Don't listen. I'll go. I'll, I'll find All out. Terrain. And... We'll figure it out. Anyway, you got to rehydrate. Also, try playing with the clock. Hmm. Come on and have it cycle on for ten minutes. Then let it rest. Instead of watering it for twenty, thirty minutes straight, yeah. why not let it water for ten minutes, rest, come back in four hours. Water it again. Your mm-hmm. clock will actually water typically up to four different time frames. Mm-hmm. So break up that water pattern so you can rehydrate over a longer period of time so it doesn't have time to run down mm-hmm. the gutters. That's a great way. And your clocks are set up to do that sure. if you know how to program it. But I would say break up the watering to, to mm-hmm. so you've got a that's gap good, yeah. so the water that's there can penetrate and then come back on in a, in a couple hours, mm-hmm. water it again. Okay. So start at like 3 o'clock, go at 5, go at 7, go at... Nine, and then you're you're hydrated for the day. Anyway, good question, Jack. We'll be right back with more on the Mountain Gardeners with Ken and Lisa Lane. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice, right for the higher elevation of Arizona, with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Sunshine Daydream Abelia. Pink and white flowers continually cover this brightly yellow shrub. Very pretty. Requires less maintenance than all the other cultivars with a compact, creamy foliage. At $34, it's a garden designer's dream bloomer that takes heat, wind, and blooms even longer with a bit of midday shade. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love easy perennials, love to shop. I grew up in the family business with my three sisters, and I've raised four of my own kids in the same garden center. Waters isn't just another business in town. This is part of our home, an extension of who we are. My family spends more time here than we do at home. It's basically an extension of our living room. We just have more friends over than most. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, and you'll feel welcomed, peaceful, and at home here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So I was doing a lot of gardening this weekend, like container pots. So it's actually changing out quite a bit. I got bored with some things. If it was struggling at all... It was ripped out of its pot and put fresh soil in and new plants. There's just so many neat, new, wonderful, fun plants to play with here at the garden center. I went, okay, I'm tired of that one. This one looks like more fun now. Sorry, fig, you must go. Sorry, raspberry, I want a blueberry. Sorry, boxwood, you're boring. We're going to put brand new, you know, gardenias in. I put a uh, pieris, beautiful. I mean, I can't believe how pretty this lily of the valley is. I mean, I've never seen anything so big, bold, and beautiful. So I got to have that. That looks great. That's going to dress up my yard. So if it was struggling, uh, ugly at all, I may have still been alive. This is going to shock some of you gardeners, but it, I, I, I sacrificed it. I said, that's it. You're out. And I added their roots to the bottom of the hill, the heap pile, and they're going to be composted or... Uh, or they're now retaining for, for soil back behind another plant that's thriving. So I just kind of changed things up. And so some things I want to share with you about container gardening, though. I, I've had a lot of folks struggling this week, uh, including myself. I planted two plastic containers. I don't know why I do this to myself. I preached to everyone else, don't plant in plastic. But they were big. They were expensive. They were formed. These are really, really nice plastic pots. And I put two coral bark uh, uh, maples in them. I've dressed them up with some begonias. And they're be- they're stunning. It's, it's beautiful. But I, pl- I put the drip irrigation up to them. And they filled with water. Going, what the heck is going on? They, they turned into bathtubs. They started to smell. I'm going, what the heck is going on here? 
Plastics. Here's why I don't like plastics. Even though I've been using these two for years, I, I would never buy another plastic pot. Okay, let me just put that out there. But since I have these, I guess I'm going to use it at least for one more year. I don't know. I'll, until the coral barks give up or I get tired of them, I'll have these two. Uh, but, but they don't breathe. Plastic does not breathe. That's great in the summer when you want to hold that moisture in. But it's terrible in the spring when the nights are cool or in the fall when the nights are cool. It just doesn't breathe. And so I tend my I tend to personally overwater things and I lose or I stress my plants out in spring and fall. I just don't like plastics. Now, the really cheap stuff you're going to buy from the marts and the boxes, that stuff is so brittle. They, they're so cheap. They don't put any UV stabilization uh, into the plastics to keep them from breaking down in the sun. So they fade, they turn color, they crack, and they break. So within a couple of years, you're picking them up and the, the lip will actually break off. Plus, they don't breathe. So you got a cheap pot that's not going to last, that you're going to have to transplant anyway into something better. Why not just make the call now and get a better pot? I really like uh, wood. Wood, I, I really have success in wood pots. They breathe. Uh, they're, they're kind to the roots. They're easy to grow in. They're usually large. Anymore, they're quite expensive for the good one. If you're doing cedar or redwood, they're crazy expensive because the price of lumber has gone up. And then eventually the bottom rots out. So eventually you're going to pick it up and then just the bottom just drops right out. And so maybe five years, three, four, five years, the bottom will rot out and just, just leave. I did have a customer line one of their wood pots with plastic and I think they're going to get into the same problem I had with my plastic pots. It needs to drain. So I told them, poke holes in the bottom so the water drains out the bottom. They were putting plastic in the to line it to keep the wood from rotting. I don't think you had to worry about that. It's just the bottom that rots, not the sides. But that's their, that was their thinking. I think they'll struggle and overwater those plants in the spring and in the fall again. My favorite, what my go-to is anymore, are clay pots. But hear me, not Mexican clay. If it's, if it's got black tar in the middle of it, don't even waste your time. It won't winter over. The winter, that freeze and thaw of the winter, just, just makes them crack and break and flake, and they're just terrible. Uh, down in Mexico, maybe in Phoenix, in the deserts where you don't get freeze and thaw, fine. I also don't, I never use Italian clay or German clay. The red terracotta pots that you're you're used to seeing, uh, again they they break, uh, they flake, and they they just don't last for the winter unless you're going to going to empty them out every winter and store them, dry store them in a shed or something. Then it would be fine. But if you're going to garden in them year round, don't waste your money, time, or energy. No matter how much they cost, they will break within a year or two. I like the Asian, the Chinese, the Italian, and the Chinese, the uh, um, Indian, Malaysian. Uh, Vietnamese clay pots, magnificent. Uh, they're high fired. They will last through the winter for us. They're typically glazed, not always glazed. Uh, sometimes they can have different colors, mochas and earth tones. Uh, but there's beautiful oxblood reds, uh, jade greens, uh, aqua colors, or just your, your, we've got a new series called Sedona. Uh, it's a, but it's a thick, high fired clay. Now you can plant in that and it will last through the winter and it breathes. So plant, it's easier to garden in those. They're a little more expensive, but you plant it once and you're done. And you're guaranteed to have years and years and years of, of, of use with, this, with a good quality pot. Whereas cheap pots, a couple of years and you're done. All right, we'll be right back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken, with the Plants of the Week and our native quaking aspen. Few experiences capture the magic of nature so well as a quaking aspen dancing in the slightest of breeze. You'll love their unique bark as it shines white with brand new leaves celebrating spring's arrival. Plant a row along your driveway or simply as a focal point in the yard. Hand-pick specimens start at under $100, but we have huge showy models as well. Waters Garden Center, where people who love their quaking aspen, they love to shop. 
Ouch! Aw, oh, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. All right, we are back with Lisa Waters Lane coming to you for, with her inspiration segment, just getting her ideas on, on how to make the gardens more beautiful, just that woman's touch. I think it's important. Now, we tag team gardens together. We did a lot of gardening mm-hmm. this week together. Uh, a lot of it was your vision and my labor, and oh. some of it was, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Digging out all those pots, the dead things, or changing them out and get that root ball out of there that's not easy stuff <laughs> fill that pot back up with soil that's not that is not true what you make it sound like i stand out there with a whip making it no i like to i put the soil i in like the serving too, pretty women and, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> anyway the, the gardens are looking phenomenal they're coming along the, I, I, I had someone drive by uh, and just looking. And then someone drive by and go, looks like a nice, nice yard. And another person walk by, I think it was a dog walker or something, going, I love your yard. He just looks that way. I'm going, you should see the backyard. It's even nicer. Anyway, we want to share some of that mm-hmm. over the airwaves. Sure. <laughs> That's, and he's done. Well, just, just teed you up. Go for it. <laughs> well, I was talking with Patty, uh, who works here. She's mainly at the register. She's our main yeah. cashier. But she is way into monarch butterflies. No doubt. She tags monarchs. Yeah. She yeah. looks for them, raises them, nurtures them, has them at the garden center. You can mm-hmm. see them in summer. And she brings them in. Names <laughs> <Little> them. <babies. laughs> it's, it's phenom- I'm trying to get her to teach a class. She's ultimate. Oh, she's she's shy. She's so good at it. Yeah. She would be really good. And she even put up um, special trellis fencing this year because when they go into their crystallis form, anyways, they need a certain size, you know, where they attach to yeah. and all this. So she she brought in particular fencing for it, like yeah. 72 feet or some ridiculous Oh, my amount. goodness. Yeah. So, yeah, she's just very into monarchs, and she definitely loves them. And so she's been putting a lot more plants into her yard to attract the monarchs. So I was asking her... Um, you know, what What plants do they really like? Out of all the ones in your yard, which ones are they really, really attracted to? Um, so she gave me some good ideas. That's good. That. Okay. We're yeah. sharing that. That's good. She, right. Yeah. She said their favorite was actually, believe it or not, the cone flower, the echinacea. Really? Yeah. Okay. Which I was really surprised. But it makes sense. makes lots of sense. She said the other one they really liked was the lantana, the Miss yep. Huff lantana, which is the really good perennial lantana for here. So they really liked that one. They like uh, rutabecchias, which are kind of like a great big daisy looking. It's kind of like a cone <laughs> flower. Same yeah. kind of big, big landing pad mm-hmm. uh, c- c- kind of flower. Perennial comes back, hardy. Mm-hmm. It puts a seed on. Good, good wildflower. Right. And the other one um, that she just raved about was the pincushion or the scabiosas. Yeah. Um, and those are really long blooming. I mean, hers bloomed last year up through November. And she said the butterflies just like come out and swarm yeah, for Yeah, that's them. true. So I thought that was kind of neat. Just those were her ones that she grows in her yards. Um, and then I was asking her, you know, when it comes to milkweed, because there's a lot of variety yeah. of milkweeds out there. I think we probably have maybe four on the at the store right yeah, now. This weekend. Yeah. Next weekend could be three or five. I don't know. It just changes all the time. Yeah. So I was like, well, does it make a difference? Because there's some that are annual, some that are perennial. And she said it really didn't make too much of a difference. It's the caterpillars that, that like yeah. the milkweed. And so it really didn't matter, you know, whether you're getting the silky gold or the Cinderella. It, you know, just have some out there for it. We even have the perennial one that's mm-hmm. that grows here too. So, uh, and and I've noticed also uh, fennel. Mm-hmm. They they'll go after our fennel. In fact, I've got fennel in the in the 
uh, herb garden, right. mainly for the monarchs mm-hmm. and their caterpillar state. Mm-hmm. They're beautiful caterpillars. I go, eat up, boys. Yeah. Have at it. Yeah. She uh, said the swallowtails actually like dill, too. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. Right. Maybe I'll plant some dill. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And I guess there's a... Uh, and I'm not... I. We need to have her come talk because she's got so much information. But she was saying there's a queen butterfly and that they actually like the milkweed as well. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we, it's great to attract the monarchs, but I also think it's fun to attract all different kinds. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Of, of you know, we had uh, painted ladies all, all over our cat mint. Mm-hmm. So they were buzzing around in the morning. I had probably 30 of them on, on wow. this one huge cat mint mm-hmm. that's so tough. And, and animals don't eat cat mint, uh, but butterflies love them. Hummingbirds right. are okay with them. They're pollinators for bees. Mm-hmm. It's just there's a lot of benefits. We can, we can make our backyards more attractive sure. to hummingbirds and butterflies if you just mm-hmm. plant a little bit. And we've got the expertise. We've got people on staff that... Right. are exceptional at that. Mm-hmm. In fact, you're not buying plants here at Waters Garden Center. You're buying expertise. The the, the nerds, the plant folks that just really love plants. <laughs> so you're not throwing away. You're not making as many mistakes. You're not going backwards. You're going forwards. Mm-hmm. Maybe not always in the full lunge for maybe sideways <laughs> lunges, but you're, you're, make, you're go, making progress going forward. Right. And we want to help you have a passion like we have a passion sure, for gardening. Sure, Because it is so wonderful. When we get home from work, we sit out on our front yep. uh, patio area and we have a little fountain that runs there. And it is so much fun to watch the birds come in, all different kinds of birds coming in. You're watching the butterflies kind of flutter around and it's just very relaxing, especially at the end of the day to sit there and watch that. So to bring that, uh, putting in plants that, um, you know, your pollinators and your birds love is amazing because it makes it so much more enjoyable when you're sitting out in the yard. Rock is not it. No. You get too much rock. You can have too much rock <laughs> accessorized by a boulder surrounded <laughs> by your cinder block wall. Mm-hmm. It's just, that's not inviting that that's no. actually destroying the migratory path that butterflies naturally use and mm-hmm. asphalting and, and paving over they're, and that's why they're they're having some struggles. Mm-hmm. That some weather change stuff. They're caught off guards, or they're migrating north too soon. Mm-hmm. Then it turns cold again. It's just mm-hmm. this weather pattern that we have currently. Whether it's mm-hmm. environmental or what's happening, I don't know. But it's it's causing wreaking havoc yeah. on the monarchs. They're struggling. I think we can introduce even a backyard patio, a deck, an apartment dweller can oh, sure. have something that would attract butterflies and help them. It not only helps them, but it helps you because there's something I think spiritual when you see a hummingbird sucking water from a fountain or a butterfly landing on a on a pincushion flower, just mm-hmm. sitting there enjoying it. Right. There's something magical about that that it connects you with, mm-hmm. that gets you unplugged from technology and plugged back into where we came from, and that's nature. And we should just all be outdoors more. And you know the thing uh, butterflies like is actually a little. I mean, it doesn't have to be soggy, wet, or really wet area, but they like a little bit of moisture in the soil. You, you ever see like a wet spot in the yard, yeah. and you just see tons of little butterflies landing there. So they say, you know, having a little spot that's maybe kind of like a little muddy moisture spot can really help bring in the butterflies as well. Some place maybe leave a – you could almost have a saucer or mm-hmm. uh, you could you could have an emitter there that doesn't go to a plant. It just goes to right. – a wet spot that would mm-hmm. attract more of your butterflies. That's mm-hmm. a good idea, actually. Yeah. I'm just full of them. You, you know? are full of it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of amazing perennials, but there's a lot of annuals, too. The pintas. Oh, yeah. Uh, good which idea. Which is, boy, you want a plant that can take the heat and the sun. Uh, pintas can certainly do it. When we were in, down in Phoenix, I saw a whole bunch of them. Uh, and if it's happy down in Phoenix, trust me. Yeah, I think it was 101 <laughs> last Monday or something. Mm-hmm. And, and it was in full bloom, just happy as could be in the heat, just right. perfectly fine. Yeah. So there's a lot of annual, there's a lot of annual uh, lantana and different things that you can put in if you don't want to, if you want to just do container gardening, although you can put a lot of perennials in containers. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to bring in nature. Yeah, we also have lavender. Mm-hmm. It's another one that we we've get, we have. Uh, there's quite a few. That's one. I tell you what, I'll print out the butterfly handout 
and yeah. have it at the register. Oh, so those folks idea. that are listening that want to come in, we've got yeah. a list of butterfly friendly plants. So if you didn't take notes, you're driving from here to there and just couldn't take it all in, come in and we'll, we'll give you the, the handout. It's free. It'll help you out what and have guy. more butterflies in, in your yard. <laughs> there we go. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop. Found in Prescott. New to the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. All right, and we are back on the Mountain Gardener. Here's the beauty of having a radio show in your garden center, just recorded right here, uh, guest that live right here, celebrities, national celebrities, shop at your place, and they go, Ken, I want to introduce myself, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. My name's Bill and Bell. So uh, I'm going, this is Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. This is great stuff. We need to get this the word out. How would you like to do a radio segment? And Bill said, sure. And Bell said, well, I guess if I need to, I can make him look good. So welcome, Bill and, and Belle. I'm glad well, that you're both here. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. And the reason we're here is because you have a radio show. We heard you on the radio oh, really? yeah. on our way to New Mexico. And Bill and I went, wow, he sounds as, as enthusiastic <laughs> as, as he is. Bill is It one is of the Mountain people. Gardener, so it does broadcast yeah. throughout the mountains of Arizona. Right. I love it. I'm just impressed of the reach. So from Kingman all the way over to the oh, White Mountains. Gosh. So it's good. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah. But you're doing important work as well just to explain what the rocky mountain seed alliance is and how did that get started and some background on this well um bell and i were lucky enough to be hired as the executive directors of native seed search which is one of the premier seed conservation organizations in the united states it's based in tucson arizona it's over 35 years old now And uh, after our tenure there, we were recruited to start a native seed search-like organization for the Rocky Mountain West. The idea is that um, seed people need to understand who is around them in their own region. It's easier to learn from each other's mistakes. It's easier to pass on successful varieties of seeds when you find them. So So there's sort of a a natural organizing principle. People will understand what you're trying to do. And nobody had ever really brought all those resources together. We have a big region. Um, We got some startup funding. We're in our fourth year now. And basically our mission is um, to have all the seeds from the whole mountain region. And we, we call that from Canada all the way down to the Mexican border. Basically, all the seeds used in that region come and, from and this the mount, region. The altitude is from 2,000 to 12,000? You know, or do you have well, a certain, mount, we, we don't anywhere in the Rockies? That. Yeah, yeah. No? We let people, yeah. we let, I mean, we have people okay. from all over the country who are involved in our programs, and we get called to different places outside of the Mountain West to do different educational events and things like that. Um, if we are... If we're educating and we're putting out information, we like to focus on the Rocky Mountain region because it's an underserved area. But I don't think we've ever said, okay, it's got to be it's got to be 2000 to you gotcha. know 15. But sure. predominantly, it's the it's it's um, cold 
climates, fringe climates, extreme gardening, if you there will. There you go. Even, yeah. the, even the people at lower elevations in the Mountain West have extreme conditions. That's usually. true. Yeah. We know. Temperature you know, swings, yeah, wind, go, go alkalinity. To, yeah. Go to Riverton, Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, check it out, you know. <laughs> so, so, the, so that's really what we do. We're trying to get people to save their own seeds again, which, you know, it to some people sounds like an impossible and new dream, but as we were talking mm. earlier, everybody did this two generations ago. We're just getting back the good stuff the stories, the connections to our place, the, the varieties that were really adapted to where we live. Why? Because we saved them and cherished them. And the ones that lived and that we saved actually knew how to live here better. Fewer inputs, that's big these days. And so it's really a pleasure for us to be able to do our job now and, and wake people up and help network them so that we can all do this together. Now, you could live anywhere in the Rocky Mountains you want because you're the executive director and... Deputy. Deputy director. There we go. Yeah, the yeah. Tag team duo. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing important work. How'd you choose? What, how'd you choose Arizona? What what oh, what brought you oh, here? Oh, I mean, oh. I I'm a, I'm a Scottsdale kid from oh, the, from okay. the '60s. We moved here from New York in the '60s, and I ended up in the Bay Area for about 17 years and came back in '95 to the gotcha. Verde because Verde the Verde is where I used to play as a kid. Yeah. And I met Bill at a permaculture course. I don't know. If of course, yes, I would expect course, nothing less. The old hippies that we are. <laughs> And uh, we fell in love. We had a couple of long dates, and it was, do we move to Idaho, where he was from, or do we move? does he move here? And I'm not a snow kid, particularly. And he was getting a little <laughs> older and didn't want to be shoveling snow anymore. So he moved here in 2005. Okay. And we've been doing a series of different things. He had a seed company for 28 years called High Altitude Gardens. He's been involved in seed work since the early 80s as an advocate and educator, um, an activist, and uh, so we were doing educational things before we were recruited at Native Seed Search in Tucson in 2011, and we were there for three years and then started this um, Rocky Mountain uh, program, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, um, and we had kept the house in Cornville all Cornville, along. Cornville, a great place. Oh, I we, love Cornville. We've been around yeah. a, a little bit traveling worldwide and always just, you know, can't so wait So now to you're home. saving these seeds. You're trying to reintroduce seeds. You're trying to Take take seed local and grow them local. Uh-huh. Uh, th- there's a great need for this. People don't we don't hear this enough. I don't think now. It's, I'm 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 on board with you. Right. Uh, right. I, we have plants going close to extinction. I mean they're they're right. disappearing. Right. So we need seed banks to keep them. So we've got access to these these plants again and then start using them again. Right. So how do you how you've got classes? You've got what do you do for your job every well, day? Well. You know, uh, inspire and educate. We try to spend 85% of our energy inspiring and educating more people to do this. We've got uh, one of our other programs is just our networking um, software on our website. We have it so that you can sign up to uh, steward a seed. Say you've got something that came from your family or your favorite and you've been saving seeds. Sometimes that happens because... You just go back out the next year, and it's grown up sure. again. It saved yeah. itself, right? But you yeah. volunteer, yeah, right? So, so now Volunteers you're a seed steward. You can go on our site, sign up, and then immediately you, you'll come up on our directory map. And we've had 284 seed stewards now in the region that have promised to save and share the seeds to one thing, and people can find each other. Um, the people around them, and they can find the varieties that they're looking for. So that's that's one of our other. So now I just had a friend things. give yeah. me some onions out of yeah. her garden. Yeah, exotic things she got from New Mexico or someplace. Yeah, I went, right. ooh, that's really neat. Yeah. Can I have some of those? Right. She said, oh, I'd love you to. This is the yeah. gardeners. This yeah. is what we do. Right. She goes, oh, I'd love you to have some of these. Now they're growing in my gardens at right. my house. Is right. that what you're you're yeah. talking yeah. about? Yeah. That. Yeah, you could do. You know, onions, of course, are lots of times propagated from. Because right. they divide, but same idea, and you could actually, we don't care if that's what you want to put in storage, just so you stored something. Because, you know, the underlying reality is we've allowed our seed production and seed companies in the, not just this country, but the world to centralize the way banks have. Yeah, and, you're right. And, and we just had the six companies that own the majority of the world's seeds become three companies just in the past year. I did not and, know that. And, huh. and so, you know, no laws are broken. You know, they're doing what good companies do. They centralize. But the first thing they do is get rid of all the stuff that's not high profit. That's what companies do, right? So if you live in a fringe climate, like just about everybody in the Rocky Mountains, there's nothing there for you. This is for big, large-scale agriculture. And we've lost maybe 90% of the kinds of varieties and things that were grown here maybe 60, 80 years ago. 
We once had a beautifully diverse agriculture. So what we're trying to do is bring that back. The, as you said, the diversity is really, really important. We're trying to reintroduce here at Waters Gardens that are non-GMO, organic, more heirloom yes. tomatoes. We've got more heirloom tomatoes than go. ever before trying to get people hooked or interested and in, in garden again take interest in the plant there there's a there's a lot to unpack with this issue there's a lot of different directions to go and and the the seed piece is so um fundamental and and so obvious once you start plugging in and the rocky mountain seed alliance which by the way is rockymountainseeds.org has lots of information not only do we have the seed program the seed stewards program but we have a grain trials program oh. and we're just trying to yes relocalize put local seed as the foundation of local food and so we have a number of programs that we do to facilitate that we really are about an inspiration and empowerment and and looking at this global perspective because if people don't know what's going on globally or why it's important then there's really no reason to save seeds if you think you can get fabulous seeds from a seed company why would you even consider it yeah but the magic is in the seed saving because then you get into the resiliency and the disease resistance and you can select for things and it's adaptable and it tastes better and it's just amazing stuff. So how do people get involved? What, how, give us a website. Give us Rocky classes. RockyMountainSeeds.org. Okay. We have a, um, an agricultural uh, program, Seed School for Seed School Teacher Training. This is a mouthful and it's government funded, by the way. Seed School Teacher Training for agricultural professionals coming up in October and then a seed summit in Santa Fe in February. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for coming in and letting us know. So Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance dot org. org. Got, got it. It's Rocky Mountain Seeds dot org. Oh, Rocky Mountain got Seeds dot org. We yeah. got it. Yeah, we right. said it four times. That's good. On air. We're live. Thanks for being in the studio. Okay, thank the Mountain you. Gardener, we will be right back with more. Don't change that dial. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Tiger Eye Sumac. You can't kill this native plant, and it's so fancy. Chartreuse foliage quickly develops into lacy yellow leaves, which contrast nicely with the posy pink stems. All this turns the color of orange peels through autumn. A dramatic focal point when planted as an accent at the edge of ponds and dry creek beds, all for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love fancy native plants love to shop. I grew up in the family business with my three sisters, and I've raised four of my own kids in the same garden center. Waters isn't just another business in town. This is part of our home, an extension of who we are. My family spends more time here than we do at home. It's basically an extension of our living room. We just have more friends over than most. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, and you'll feel welcomed, peaceful, and at home here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. This is such a good time to be planting. As we go into June, what you'll find is perennials come into bloom, into favor. We just unloaded a truck this week. I don't know how many thousands of plants, a ton of them, uh, but lots of perennials. They start to go into bloom, so it's a time to, to plant, to pick and plant perennial plants. These are, remember, perennial and permanent. Both start with P. So they, you plant them once, and they keep coming back year after year after year for you. So these are echinaceas, gallardias, salvias. There's all there's. Literally hundreds upon hundreds of different perennials here at the garden center right now that you plant it once and they will come back for year after year after year. From shade lovers to sun lovers to pollinators to plants that animals don't eat. We've got them uh, kind of grouped together by use. Uh, some just for butterflies and bees, some just for, and then you can go shop, makes it easier to shop those different plants. But June 
this this coming month is the best time to be planting. Now, what you'll find with perennials, they tend to be more expensive. Let me explain why. Perennials generally have to be two years old. They're at the farm for two years before they will bloom, before they will inspire. Before that, they're just basically green things in a bucket. They're, they're, they need to be at least two years old before they're old enough, mature enough to bloom. Whereas annuals, that is those plants that live for a year and, and then they're done, uh, the, the geraniums, those we start by cuttings. So we'll root those out, we grow them on, and they flush out and they'll bloom. Guaranteed this year they will bloom. So they're easier to grow. They're at the farm for anywhere from weeks to just a few months. And so they're much less expensive because there's less time handling, pruning, nurturing these things. Whereas a perennial, we planted those last year. We cut them back when they died this winter. And then we flushed them out again this spring. Now we're fl- So they're, they're literally two to three to four times older uh, farm, farm-wise than, let's say, an annual will be. So they'll be two or three dollars more expensive, generally speaking, uh, depending on what the model is, uh, depending on what it is. Some things like uh, an Eto peony, that thing has to be at least five to seven years old before it will bloom. Uh, but we've got them in you know that size. Now, that's a $100 perennial because it's been around forever. The thing is ancient. It also only comes in one size, a great big five-gallon plant. So it just depends on what which perennial you're using and how long the farmer had to had to shape and, and control and nurture this plant before it came in as the perfect specimen here at the garden center. So perennials are typically, I don't know, anywhere from ten to twenty bucks for most of them. But you can get you can trend higher depending on, on how you like to collect them, how unique, how unusual that perennial are is. So that's the difference between the two. And there you'll see there's a little price difference. That's why but I think it's I think perennials are better because you plant them once and they keep coming back every year. In my container gardens, we put a perennial in as the anchor and then we accessorize with, with annuals. So we we have something that will come back every year in that pot, but then we add color uh, to them just to make it look more English or cottage garden or just over the top. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how beautiful that is kind of color. So that's what we want in our containers. And so with our peonies, we plant snapdragons, and I've p- posted that on our Instagram account. If you if you want to know what our gardens look like, follow us on on Instagram or Facebook. I guess it migrates over, but Instagram is just all photos, basically, of the Lane Gardens. <laughs> so Waters Garden Center, AZ. You can find us if you want to want to get there. Anyway, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. We didn't get to your questions, or we didn't quite touch on what your what your interests are. Come in and say hi. Visit. Be glad to help you personally, one on one. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona, with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I used to be cocky and actually dared to beat the big boxes at their own game. Since the beginning, we were known for the very best plants in town. But with youthful ambition, we added a line of inferior plants, contractor grade, that matched the box stores and beat their prices. We failed miserably. The plants were side by side. Waters hand-picked quality at the higher price and the inferior plants at the lower price with astounding results. The inferior plants, not bad quality, just not full and nice, were still there a month later. The hand-picked quality plants, they had been restocked twice and the bench was empty again. The youthful cockiness, it's tempered and with age comes wisdom and knowing who you really are. Waters Garden Center doesn't compete with the marts and the boxes. We simply grow the very best plants our family is famous for. We will never offer inferior plants. Cross my heart. Pinky Swear, Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.